in Ohio's capital, a field becomes a graveyard when a woman's body is discovered. But solving the murder would be a challenge. Detectives turn to a difficult and rare technique in hopes of finding her killer. 911 receives a desperate call in Fort Worth, Texas. A man's wife is shot. Forensic investigators search for clues in unlikely places, hoping the victim herself could provide information needed to determine how and why she died. Whether a crime is meticulously planned or carried out in a moment of passion, perpetrators leave behind evidence. With a discerning eye, investigators reveal fatal impressions killers leave behind. In this episode, some of the names have been changed. Columbus, the capital of Ohio, is known for its wholesome Midwest values, a growing community where the rate of violent crime is much lower than other cities its size. Yet on November 7, 2001, Richard Middleton made a startling discovery. In a vacant lot, he found the body of a nude female lying in a tangle of overgrown weeds. He immediately called 911. The operator on call dispatched a team of investigators to the site. Columbus police officers and medical technicians arrived at the location south of downtown Columbus. The victim was pronounced dead at the scene. Investigators roped off the area and started gathering evidence. They hoped to piece together the events that left a woman dead. As they processed the crime scene, investigators noted the victim's position. She was lying on her back. Her arm was raised above her head. And her undergarments were pulled down around her ankles. But the most alarming evidence found by the crime text were ligature marks on the victim's neck. They suspected she was strangled. Investigators gathered a few items of clothing, including a black and white tennis shoe found near the body. Despite all their findings, police uncovered no solid leads. They were a long way from finding the killer. Ronald Jester was the first detective on the scene. Well, we had very little forensic evidence at the scene. There was no weapon, uh, nothing to indicate who she may have been with, where she had been. We found no identification of her. There's no way of, of tracing her to any particular spot or anything. None of the things that you hope you find that will give you a direction to, to begin to look for a suspect. Investigators also spoke to neighbors in the area. Several said they heard screaming earlier but they thought it was just kids playing in the field. But no one remembered seeing anyone or anything suspicious. Crime techs photographed the area as well as the body. Okay, Bill, you're ready to bag her right hand? They carefully preserved the woman's hands. They hoped material found under her fingernails could provide clues. The body of the victim was then transported to the Franklin County Coroner's Office. There, they took more detailed photos, focusing on several bruised areas. Dr. Brad Lewis, the Franklin County Coroner, performed the autopsy. He noticed the marks on the victim's neck. After analyzing the wounds, Dr. Lewis was able to determine the cause of death. 
She had blunt trauma, which means she had been beaten throughout the body, arms, and legs. She had also been strangled, uh, which was the actual cause of her death. They collected tissue and other material samples found under the victim's fingernails. The forensic team detected heavy bruising that indicated evidence of rape. Using a rape kit, they gathered possible DNA evidence left from her assailant. All evidence was sealed and sent for further analysis. The examiner then took her fingerprints in the hopes of finding out who she was. When police submitted the prints to the Ohio Fingerprint Data Bank, they quickly confirmed her identity. The victim was Tina Baxter, age 29. She had a police record for several minor offenses. Police also learned that she had had many addresses. She had been drifting from place to place and from job to job. At the Columbus Crime Lab, criminalist Amarina Clarkson analyzed the evidence gathered at autopsy. She examined the rape kit findings as well as the victim's clothes. She also analyzed the stains found on the victim's undergarments for traces of blood and DNA. We were able to tell that the swabs had semen present by using a color test that will indicate that there's a possibility of semen being present. After we do that color test, we then use a test that looks for a protein that is only found in high levels in semen. This information confirmed sexual assault and gave investigators DNA information about the assailant. Yet they had no suspect to compare to the samples. His identity remained a mystery. To get more information about Tina, detectives questioned the victim's relatives and friends, including her brother. Just a couple days ago. Baxter's brother told police Tina had had problems in the past. She used drugs, but she was trying to get her life together. Her brother explained that she was a devoted mother who was involved with her children. But he was afraid that Tina may have had a relapse. He said that in the past, it wasn't unusual for Tina to go on a drug binge and disappear for a few days. He told detectives the names of bars she frequented. If Tina had given in to her addiction, she would not have to look far to satisfy her cravings. Detectives went to the bar where Tina was known to hang out. Seen this woman here before. When he passed her picture around, patrons recognized her, but none could place her there on the night she was murdered. Uh, Bob Johnson. Victim. Detectives hit a dead end. The investigation was stalled. In order to spark some theories, investigators pulled together a team to analyze all aspects of the data they had recovered. The team offered different scenarios based on the evidence. Forensic evidence at the scene. Marks on her legs looks like she put up some sort of a struggle and whoever took her clothes off of her had to fight with her to get her clothes but off. But they were coming up empty. They found nothing that could advance their case. They were still no closer to a suspect. But that was about to change. Only 11 days after finding Tina's body, a construction worker at a South Columbus job site picked up some tools. Something caught his attention in the underbrush. When he took a closer look, he made a horrifying discovery. The nude body of a female lay lifeless on the ground. Detectives arrived at the crime scene. It was a place they'd been before. This location was only a few hundred feet from where they found Tina's body. Detective William Gillette drove to the crime scene. Detective Jester and I were driving to the scene and we were discussing some of the similarities that the patrol officers had told us over the air. 
it quickly became apparent the evidence at this location was frighteningly similar to Tina's murder. A young woman stripped of her clothing with signs of sexual assault. Detective Gillette surveyed the crime scene. What we first noticed was that the victim uh, was in pretty bad shape and it appeared she had been drugged for a distance uh, and put up maybe a pretty good struggle. Crime scene investigators once again collected evidence. They gathered what was thought to be her clothing, undergarments, sneakers, which were discarded near the body. Investigators then spotted something unusual. Here's the absent. Freezing here on the arm, down by the wrist, and also up here on the forearm. Those actually look like fingers. Yeah. So they noticed distinct the, bruising on her arm in the shape of a hand. They hoped it might prove a clue to the killer's identity. You can see on her right arm uh, where there was a lot of bruising, and you can see actual finger indentions were left on her skin. Uh, I thought it might be possible to get fingerprints off of that area. The crime technicians were careful not to disturb the body. If they could lift prints from the bruise, they would have to take great care not to destroy them. To preserve the body for this type of analysis, detectives did not bag the victim. They needed to keep the body's temperature at approximately 70 degrees to ensure the fingerprints could be lifted successfully. Any colder and the fingerprint powder would not stick, making the lift impossible. It appeared as if the earlier murder was not an isolated incident. Investigators were now dealing with two crimes, but possibly only one killer. And that killer was stalking the area. He had already found his second victim. They needed to stop him before he added a third. I think that's an interesting thing. This one piece will make 52 layers. Watch on mobile devices or the big screen. All for free. No subscription required. In Columbus, Ohio, two women were found dead, their unclothed bodies discarded in remote locations on the city's south side. Both women were found face up. Investigators determined that the first victim, Tina Baxter, was strangled and sexually assaulted. Yet they had no suspect matching DNA samples. And the circumstances surrounding the second victim were hauntingly similar. With one difference. There was a bloody rock that was lying next to her. It appeared she had died from a blow to the head rather than strangulation. Detective William Gillette continued to canvass the second crime scene, which was less than a football field away from where Tina Baxter was found. He noticed distinct tire tracks in the shaly soil leading from the scene of the crime. You can see where there were fresh tire tracks made by what appeared to be a pickup truck. Crime techs took photographs and measurements of the tracks but because of the loose soil, they could not make a plaster cast of the markings. At the state crime lab in Columbus, the body was autopsied. Investigators utilized the most advanced forensic techniques to examine the body. The victim had a distinct bruise in the shape of a human hand on her arm. Coroner Dr. Brad Lewis examined the bruises and determined that there was a clear sign of a struggle. She had multiple abrasions and contusions uh, on her arms, legs, and uh, body. She also had significant blunt trauma to her neck. They took okay. photographs recording their particular shape and location. Some other evidence from the, the guy's body in addition to the possible. Specialists then tried to find evidence undetectable by the human eye in normal light. What we're going to do with this is look for hairs and fibers that may have been shed onto her body by the suspect. We're also looking for hairs and fibers that she may have picked up of his car. Using an alternate light source, they looked for these obscured clues. 
but this examination yielded nothing significant. Lab technicians then proceeded with a fairly complex and rarely successful procedure. They would attempt to lift the perpetrator's fingerprints from the body itself. Special Agent Gary Wilgus supervised the attempt. The possibility of getting prints off human skin is remote. Uh, there's only been about 75 to 80 documented cases in the nation where uh, prints have actually been taken off of bodies. To lift these prints, technicians first placed a plastic tent over the body. This created a makeshift fumigation chamber. They then placed a container filled with a superglue substance known as cyanoacrylate into a warming plate. As the glue heats up, fumes are emitted. Those fumes from the heated superglue adhere to the body in the latent fingerprints. Then what we try to do is take magnetic powder, which is a special type of fingerprint powder, and we start to process the body, searching for any kind of indication the print may exist. This powder consists of superfine magnetic filaments, which adhere to the superglue residue. Any identifiable prints become evident. A gel is applied to these markings, which then solidifies after a few minutes. The dried substance is then lifted off the skin, taking any print impressions with it. The bruises on the victim's arm yielded no prints. Yet on her right thigh, they discovered another possible clue, a perfectly intact palm print. But most databases do not record palm prints. So even if the killer left his mark, investigators still had nothing to go on. Forensic technicians proceeded with the examination. They took inked prints from the victim's fingers. An ID was made immediately. Her name was Kathy Henderson. She too, like the first victim, had a police record and a history of drug use. Detectives notified the family. Sir, but uh, this afternoon we found your daughter, uh, and she is a uh, victim of a homicide. Tell me exactly what happened that night. Midnight. They questioned Kathy's roommate well, and a friend. The friend remembered the night Henderson disappeared. Um, Kathy's away. friend said that the three of them had been cruising around. Kind of bored, so <laughs> At about midnight, he dropped off her roommate in downtown Columbus. Kathy asked to be left off as well, but asked him to wait. She'd be back. He said he suspected she was trying to score some drugs. He waited for her, but she never returned. Frustrated, he went home. That was the last time they saw Kathy alive. News of the Kathy Henderson murder made front page headlines. Police knew this would create fear within the Columbus community, but they hoped it would lead to more clues about the two crimes. It didn't take long before a witness came forward. Bill, it's Mr. Dooley. I'm Mr. Dooley, how are you? He said he saw a dark pickup truck in the early morning hours at the construction site where Henderson's body was found. As he drove past, he noticed the vehicle. The headlights were on, but he did not see anyone inside. Can you describe that vehicle to us? He said he really didn't think much about it until he read the newspaper articles about the murders. He then showed investigators exactly where the vehicle had been parked. Detectives went to the construction area where the truck was sighted and questioned the workers at that location. Any reason for a vehicle to be on your lot? The workers confirmed it was unusual for a vehicle to be there on a Sunday. Uh -huh. They also told detectives that none of the employees owned a truck that fit the description. Detectives believed time was running out. They were no closer to identifying a suspect, and the Columbus community was living in fear. Since both victims were found so close to one another, they decided to try and stop him 
before he reached victim number three. Police set up surveillance near the crime scenes. If their suspect came back, they would be there waiting. Detective Russell Redman believed it was only a matter of time before the killer struck again. It concerned me very much the fact that we had a serial killer uh, in the city of Columbus uh, preying on women. Anybody in it uh, could have been his next victim. Police ran a 24-hour surveillance detail at the construction site. They knew they had to catch the killer before he struck again. But only four days after Kathy Henderson's murder, the detective's fears were confirmed. An office worker on the south side of Columbus was taking out the trash to a dumpster. He noticed the body of a woman lying on the ground. He immediately called police. Detectives believed it was victim number three. The killer had struck again. A third woman turned up dead within the span of only a few weeks. Detectives were notified and left for the scene of the crime. The latest victim was a young white female. She was found in the same vicinity as the other two. There appeared to be blood around her mouth and on her hands. She wore a black sweatshirt and sweatpants. The pockets had been turned inside out. Detective Redmond's worst fear had become reality. We felt very strongly that this scene and this homicide victim were connected to the other two. The victim was identified as Beth Ellen Fisher. She fit a similar profile as the other victims. She had a criminal record for petty crime, drifted from job to job, and had a history of drug abuse. She was strangled and sexually assaulted. The M.O. appeared to be the same as the other murders. Yet, unlike the other crime scenes, police got an unexpected break. Detective Russell Redmond noticed tire tracks leaving the area, similar to those found near Tina Baxter's body. But this time, there was evidence the tire had actually come off its rim. I noticed that there was a, a pattern in the graveled area of a parking lot. Uh, the pattern was very strange, and it took me a few minutes to realize that it was, in fact, a wheel mark from somebody driving a vehicle on a flat tire. They followed the markings the wheel left behind. The tracks led to a pickup truck only 50 feet from where the woman's body had been found. The tire was visibly off the rim. When the truck had pulled into the crime scene, the tire was fully inflated. But sometime soon after, the tire blew, leaving the rim bare and the vehicle undrivable. The license plate was still on the vehicle. Investigators photographed the distinct tire marks and detailed the course the truck traveled. DMV records determined the owner of the truck was a local man who owned a tree trimming business. They brought the man in for questioning. He told police he didn't know the whereabouts of his truck. Detectives told him that it had been abandoned near the scene of a crime. He claimed he had lent it to one of his employees, a man named Christian Fuhr. He said Fewer needed the truck because his own vehicle had been impounded. The owner of the truck gave consent to a search of the vehicle. Investigators found no forensic evidence placing Beth Ellen Fisher inside the truck. Detective Redman brought Christian Fewer in for questioning. He remained very cool. He did not show much emotion. Fewer told the detective that on the evening of Fisher's murder, he had met two girls and went driving around in their vehicle. He said the girls dropped him at a bar around 4 a.m. and he went home. Detective Redmond suspected Fewer's alibi wouldn't hold up. 
during the initial stages of the investigation, uh, being aware that uh, his truck was, in fact, within 50 feet of where the body was found and he denied being in that area, we knew immediately that he was lying to us. Detectives now had a viable suspect, but they did not even have enough evidence to link him to one murder, and they needed to link him to all three. While the detectives ran 24-hour surveillance on the suspect, forensic teams searched the area around the construction site to look for any evidence that would tie Christian Fuhr to the murders. But their search turned up nothing. Then, detectives got a break. A woman came forward. She said she had been helping all three victims kick their drug problem. She told police she had important information about the night Beth Ellen Fisher was killed. She remembered running into a man who said Beth Ellen owed him $50. They both left, got in a black pickup truck, and drove off together. The woman knew Beth Ellen referred to the man as Woodman. He had this nickname because he worked for a tree trimming company. Police finally had probable cause to obtain search warrants for the Christian Fuhr vehicle. Since Fuhr's vehicle was already impounded on another unrelated parking violation, police were able to move quickly. Forensic technicians arrived to process the truck. Ink prints were made of the tires. Detective Redman and his team knew they had to get this serial killer off the street. At the Columbus Crime Lab, criminalist Heather Crock reviewed tire track photos taken from the scene of the second murder. She compared these to the truck fewer owned. I was able to say that the trip pattern in the impression had the same class characteristics or similar tread pattern to one of the tires on the suspect's vehicle. With consistent characteristics matching the tire, police believed they could now place two different trucks that Fuhr had driven, his own and the one he borrowed from his boss, at two of the murder sites. But they needed to definitively prove that Fuhr had actually been there. Police obtained a court order to collect blood and saliva samples from Christian Fuhr. Forensic technician Amarina Clarkson examined the DNA samples to see if there were any similarities. Clarkson was able to confirm what police suspected. When I compared the samples of the semen found on the victim's body and the bloodstain standard from Christian Fuhr, I found that those samples matched each other. Investigators corroborated this with other evidence taken from Kathy Henderson's body. Robin Roggenbeck, a forensic scientist for the Bureau of Criminal Identification and Investigation, compared the palm print found on the second victim's body to those collected from Fuhr. I found 12 to 13 points uh, that did match positively. In my opinion, this was 100% identification. I had two other qualified examiners verify these prints, and they also came up with the same conclusion. This evidence not only proved Fuhr had touched the woman, it also meant he had done so after she had died, since prints on living skin will disappear quickly due to perspiration and body movement. Armed with these facts, detectives brought in Fuhr to interrogate him again. Christian, we want to talk to you today about three women that have been murdered in the south end of Columbus. They presented him with the details of what they had uncovered, but he refused to talk. Even without a confession, the evidence was overwhelming. I'm sorry, but I have no other choice but to charge you with the murder. On November 28, 2001, police arrested Christian Fuhr on three counts of murder. Using forensic evidence, investigators pieced together the events that led to Kathy Henderson's murder. 
Skewer had probably lured Kathy into his truck by promising her drugs. He then drove to the construction site. There, he became violent. Her resistance only fueled his rage. Out of control, he found a rock and struck her dead. In order to avoid the death penalty, Christian Fuhrer eventually pled guilty to all three murders. He was sentenced to three consecutive life sentences without the possibility of parole. Some killers prey on strangers, making it easier for them to conceal their identity. Others strike closer to home, leaving traces that are more difficult to hide. Fort Worth, Texas is known as the city where the West begins. With its rich cowboy heritage, guns outnumber people three to one. But rarely do the citizens believe they'll be used to commit violent crime. Fort Worth 911, operator L350, what is your emergency? Yet on the night of March 14, 1995, violence was all too present. A dispatch officer received a frantic 911 call. The caller identified himself as Warren Horanick, a former police officer. He explained that his wife had shot herself and needed an ambulance. Fort Worth police officers responded immediately. When paramedics arrived, Warren Horanick met them at the door. He had blood on his shirt. His wife, Bonnie, lay on her bed. Paramedics noticed what appeared to be a gunshot wound to the chest. They tried to find a pulse or any signs of life, but they were too late. Bonnie Horanek was dead. Crime technicians and investigators arrived at the scene and began collecting evidence. When detectives searched the bedroom, they found two weapons a shotgun, and a 38 caliber revolver. Detective J.D. Roberts of the Fort Worth Police Department was the lead investigator. He retraced the path of the bullet. The projectile had gone completely through her, through the mattress, through the springs, and had damaged the carpet under the bed. The bullet's trajectory indicated that it had passed through the victim while she was lying on the bed. There were no bullet fragments found anywhere in the room. Detectives noted a pillowcase wrapped tightly around Bonnie's neck. But there was no evidence that indicated a struggle. Police examined the doors and windows to see if there were signs of forced entry but there was nothing out of the ordinary. This had not been a break-in. In Fort Worth, Texas, Bonnie Hornick was found shot to death in her bedroom. There was no evidence of a break-in and detectives suspected suicide. Detectives needed to speak with Bonnie's husband to try and piece together the events that led to her death. But the way Warren was acting, Police detective J.D. Robert knew it would be a challenge. He had been drinking, and he was belligerent towards the officers, and not really cooperative. Hornick told the officers that he loved his wife and couldn't believe that she had shot herself. Since he was the only one in the house at the time of his wife's death, he needed to give a formal statement and was escorted to the police station. Investigators asked Horneck what happened that night. He told police that he and Bonnie had gone out to dinner, where he admitted to having a few beers. When they returned home, Bonnie had gone straight to bed. She was an attorney and had appointments early the next morning. Warren said he wasn't tired, so he stayed up in the living room to watch TV. Shortly after they both settled in, 
Warren said he heard a single gunshot. Startled, he quickly grabbed his shotgun and headed into the bedroom. He thought there was an intruder in his home. To his horror, he said he found his wife shot, and she wasn't moving. He phoned 911 and performed CPR in a desperate effort to revive her. He said the 911 operator instructed him to wrap the pillowcase around Bonnie's neck to control the bleeding. When asked where his wife got the handgun, Warren Horanek told detectives the 38 caliber revolver found in the bedroom was his. It was kept in a holster under the mattress on Bonnie's side of the bed. Detectives asked Horanek to submit to a gunpowder residue test. He agreed, but there was no trace of gunpowder. Investigators also requested that Horanek's clothing be sent to the crime lab for forensic analysis. Although all the evidence appeared to point towards suicide, detectives needed to complete the investigation. They told Warren Horanek to go home and they would call him with any further questions. Investigators hoped the autopsy would provide the answers needed to close the case. The coroner examined the body and determined Bonnie was shot once in the chest. He noted the bullet's path. It entered the chest and exited her back. No bullet fragments were recovered from the body. In many ways, her death appeared to be a suicide. The angle of the wound and the position, just to the left of center, was consistent with a self-inflicted injury. But other evidence pointed in a different direction. When a gun is fired, it usually leaves behind traces of gunpowder on the shooter. The coroner examined the victim's hands for signs of gunpowder residue. None was found. Unable to definitively prove either homicide or suicide, the official autopsy report characterized the death of Bonnie Horanek as undetermined. Detective J.D. Roberts had many questions. During the investigation of this death of Bonnie Horanek, it appears that the crime scene had been tampered with. Since no projectile was found, her hands apparently had been wiped clean because there was no blood on her hand. In an attempt to prove the suicide theory, detectives met with Bonnie's parents. But often, family members Thank don't you, want to accept that their loved one committed so suicide. Can you tell me a little Bonnie's about parents you? were no different. Really they refused to believe their daughter had taken her own life. The only stress they were aware of was her marriage. Bonnie had told her parents Warren was struggling with a drinking problem. She said she considered leaving her husband, but was trying to make the marriage work. Although her parents said nothing specific, they believed Warren Horanek may have had something to do with their daughter's death. Bonnie's parents urged the detective to keep the investigation open. But with little to go on and no solid proof of either murder or suicide, detectives had hit a dead end. The evidence they did have divided investigators right down the middle. The gun was checked for fingerprints, but the surface of the gun's handle was not conducive to prints, and none were recovered. Detective Jim Varnon, who was also assigned to the case, believed the facts clearly pointed to suicide. No gunshot residue found on the hands of the decedent doesn't mean much to us, because not all guns emit gunpowder residue when they're fired. Investigators needed to determine how much residue the gun typically left behind. That gun was tested and it was found to be a very clean firing gun. It doesn't emit gunshot residue. So it's no surprise that we did not find gunshot residue on the hands of Bonnie Horneck or Warren Horneck. Once again, no solid proof. 
the investigation was at a standstill. Detectives turned to another piece of evidence found at the crime scene, hoping it would provide clues as to what occurred that night. At the Fort Worth Crime Lab, blood spatter expert Max Courtney examined Warren Horanek's blood-stained shirt. Courtney needed to determine where Horanek was when his wife was shot. Was he close enough to have her blood spattered across his chest? But his findings were far from conclusive. The blood stains on the Warren Horanek shirt consisted of small to medium-sized blood droplets, which would be consistent with uh, blood from a gunshot wound or also equally uh, consistent with expirated blood that might have come perhaps from Bonnie Warnick's uh, chest wound while he was doing CPR on her. This information appeared to support the theory that Warren had tried to save Bonnie's life, not take it. Given the lack of evidence proving murder, there seemed to be only one obvious conclusion. Bonnie Hornig took her own life. It was a very uh, typical suicide. To control his, uh, his Bonnie's parents continued to suspect Warren Horanick had killed their daughter. They refused to accept suicide as the cause of death. But at this point, there was no other evidence that pointed to the contrary. The official cause of death would remain undetermined. And unless someone could uncover new evidence, that is the way it would stay. In Fort Worth, Texas, Bonnie Horanek was found on her bed, shot to death. There was evidence that indicated suicide, but nothing in the victim's past to support it. The state of their marriage, the lack of gunshot residue, and the fact that her husband Warren had blood on his shirt all raised suspicions. The coroner wasn't certain whether her wounds indicated suicide or murder. Because preliminary forensic analysis was inconclusive, the DA knew it would be impossible to get an indictment. Bonnie's parents refused to believe their daughter took her own life. Frustrated, they enlisted the help of private attorney Mike Ware to look into the case. I'd known Bonnie. I believed very, very strongly that this was not a suicide. Um, so uh, if it wasn't a suicide, uh, the only other logical conclusion was, was that it was a homicide. Ware checked Warren Horanick's record as a police officer, reviewing his personnel file. The facts were troubling. While on the force, Horanick had accumulated a string of drunk and disorderly charges. And he discovered something even more disturbing. On several occasions, he fired his weapon at home. After one of his more violent outbursts, Bonnie called police to try and calm her husband down. But Horanek was out of control. He was detained and ordered to undergo a psychiatric evaluation. As I looked more and more into the case, it was, it was very obvious to me that he fit a pattern, and their relationship fit a pattern where he would certainly be capable of doing something like this. Ware knew that neither Warren's drinking problem nor violent behavior proved he was a murderer. But he did believe the lack of gunshot residue on the victim's hand was telling. Once again, thinking about it logically, that's something that's easy to wash off. He's a police officer, former police officer. He knows that. Uh, and he certainly, if he was the one who pulled the trigger, certainly in a position to wash any gunshot residue off. As it, it, if it had been a suicide, then obviously she is not in a position to do that. But nothing in Bonnie's actions pointed to suicide. She had actually scheduled a business trip for the day following the night she died. No, I don't believe she had any the family turned to Dr. Cathal Grant, a noted forensic pathologist from Bedford, Texas, who specializes in performing psychological autopsies on people who have committed suicide. Dr. Grant interviewed relatives, friends, and co-workers and heard consistent tales about how happy and upbeat Bonnie was. Nothing in her life indicated she was contemplating suicide. 
She'd even kept hopeful fortune cookie messages in her purse. Dr. Grant concluded this did not fit the profile of a woman planning to shoot herself in the chest with a 38 caliber revolver. Based on what I looked at, it appeared unlikely or extremely unlikely that she was the type of person that would take her own life. To analyze the physical evidence, attorney Mike Ware enlisted the help of Dr. Tom Bevel, a renowned forensic scientist and expert in blood spatter analysis. Bevel set out to determine whether the blood found on Horonek's shirt was caused by the spray of a gunshot or by blood coughed up through the nose or mouth during CPR. The expectorant blood pattern would be quite different than the spray from a gunshot. In his lab, Bevel recreated a gunshot blood pattern fired from close range. He placed a t-shirt like the one Horonek wore that night in close proximity to a blood-soaked sponge. He then fired a weapon that was similar to the one found at the scene of the crime. The spray from the blood produced a blood spatter pattern on the t-shirt. He then examined the t-shirt, noting the droplets' characteristics. They were not consistent with expectorant blood. Expect it out of the mouth, it's a little bit lighter in color. Because air is what is forcing it out, there will be bubbles. Now, by the time that the police look at uh, the resultant blood stains, what you will have is bubble rings because the bubble will have burst. Expectorant blood droplets tend to be irregular in size. Bevel also examined the actual T-shirt Warren had on that evening. The blood stains that I looked at in this case uh, did not appear to be lighter in color. They didn't have bubble rings. Uh, most of the stains were fairly uniform in size. Bevel counted more than 100 of these high-velocity blood spatters. Most no more than one-tenth of a millimeter in diameter, the size of a poppy seed. Bevel believed the existence of these tiny spatters positively concluded that Warren Horanek was in very close proximity to his wife when she was shot. When I examined the uh, T-shirt that was worn uh, by Mr. Uh, Hornick, uh, was able to uh, find a uh, good number of uh, misting-type blood stains that would be consistent with what you would expect to find from a high-velocity occurrence, such as uh, back spatter. The blood pattern of the gunshot test and the blood pattern on Hornick's actual T-shirt matched. It was not expectorant blood. This evidence meant only one thing. Dr. Bevel believed Warren Horanek pulled the trigger and killed his wife. Armed with this new forensic evidence, attorney Mike Ware presented the findings to the grand jury. You have the right to remain silent. Anything you say will... The grand jury voted to indict Warren Horanek. In March 1996, one year after the death of his wife, Horanek was arrested and charged with murder. With the accumulated evidence, investigators came up with a sequence of events that led to the murder. They concluded Warren Horanek had been drinking heavily. They believed he and Bonnie argued over her upcoming business trip. She eventually turned in, but Warren grew more enraged. He waited elsewhere in the house for her to fall asleep. One of his uncontrollable outbursts finally went too far. Warren Horanek <laughs> killed his own wife. If you look at, at his history, at his escalating patterns of domestic abuse, you know, I mean, this is all in retrospect, but uh, it's clear which way he was headed. In August 1996, after a week-long trial, Warren Horanek was found guilty of murder. He was sentenced to 30 years in prison. When a murder occurs, assailants try to outsmart investigators by covering their tracks. Yet advances in forensic science bring even the smallest details to light, revealing the fatal impressions that lead killers directly to justice.